the after lunch crowd. So if you see someone beside you nodding off, just give them one of these, okay? And I'll, I'll try and point it out from up here. First, I'd like to start by thanking Jeff, Paul, and the F2 Technologies team for having me here. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, what I'm going to do is, is give you an overview of 5G, um, not from a carrier network perspective, but from people who are kind of avid users and integrators of this technology. So I was fortunate to be at Degero when we went from 3G to LTE, which was a game changer for us. Things got so much better. Um, we predict the same thing with 5G, and hopefully you'll see that um, when we get to uh, the end of this presentation. So this is going to be a very practical overview. I'm not going to get into too much, too much tech. So what is 5G? Um, there's really three pieces to it. There's the radio piece, radio access network. There's the mobile backhaul, and then there's the core network. Um, and you see all sorts of marketing out there. You know, I think AT&T really fell on it when they introduced 5GE, which really wasn't 5G. But real 5G, um, as defined by 3GPP, is 5G new radio. So that basically means we're going to deal with a whole bunch of cool new features that I'm going to tell you about kind of one by one. There's five of them. Um, and that, re it, that really is what comprises th what is the fifth generation of cellular network technology and provides this broadband access that's been like really super hyped. And I think we're getting to a, a point on the hype reality curve now where this is actually, as you'll see, going to be real. We're, we're very close to this being real. It's been way overhyped, but it's, it's, it's coming. So what are the key improvements for 5G? So everybody probably has a phone in their pocket. That's an LTE phone. You're on LTE even in this building. Works just about everywhere. Thank you to the great networks we have in Canada. But what 5G brings along to the party is um, new spectrum. We'll talk about that. Um, small cells, which we're actually on a small cell in here in this building probably, but 5G is going to take that to a new level. Massive MIMO and beam forming, and MIMO means multi-input, multi-output, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, edge compute, which I think has some really potentially interesting applications in media for contribution and other things. And then something called network slicing, which um, we'll talk a little bit about that, how you can do essentially differentiated services again, which might have a really positive impact for, for media. So. What about all this new spectrum? Um, what's, what's going on? And there's kind of a big debate, particularly in the US right now, if you're following along. Um, this actually has a big impact on media because they're trying to take spectrum away from C-band satellite, which is used for a lot of cable and other distribution services, and give it to the mobile carriers. So there's a big fight, and that's going to hopefully be resolved in, uh, in September. But that opens up um, new bands in the mid bands, which are three and a half to six gigahertz. And that is kind of the, the backbone of the 5G that most of us will be using. Um, there's also high bands that are opening up, which you'll see called various things, but one of the things it's commonly called is millimeter wave. And this is essentially like microwave. Um, when it's up, things become increasingly directional. So that becomes more challenging. So you know, for um, a kind of um, fixed, really high data rate link, millimeter wave is actually pretty cool. It works really great. If you try and put that into a handheld device, there can be challenges because millimeter wave is very effective buildings. Um, if you're holding a device which has antennas for millimeter wave and you put your hands over the antennas, it doesn't work very well. And there's some really great demos on that at Mobile World Congress where I was in, uh, in uh, May in, uh, in, in Barcelona. <laughs> Um, and carriers are taking very different approaches to this. So in the, in the U.S., T-Mobile has been pushing really in Canada. We had a Spectrum auction actually earlier this year. Um, and everyone but Bell bought in big on, like, on the low frequencies. And low frequencies are great. So I'm talking six to 700 megahertz because they go right through buildings. So what this all boils down to is 5G is about a whole bunch of bands all at the same time. For, so for long-range coverage like you get on LTE now, you want low band. If you're in a metropolitan area, um, typically you'll end up on a mid-band. And then if you're in a dense urban area when it's fully rolled out, and we're not there yet, but um, you will be on millimeter wave typically. Um, so that's basically the story on spectrum. And I'll talk more um, coming up about kind of where we are in Canada since um, that's probably of interest to people. So um, one thing that happens because you have these highly directional, shorter range millimeter wave um, frequencies, is that stuff just doesn't go as far. You can't transmit as far. So what people are doing is building out small cells. And you hear, you, you know, the one extreme is we're going to have a cell on every telephone pole or every light standard. Um, I don't think you're actually going to see that. If you do, it'll be a very, very long time. 
but, but really, you do need to address these propagation challenges caused by high frequencies, and one way to do that is with small cells. Um, when you start to do this, network design actually becomes really, really complicated, and you're gonna have overlapping cells and stuff like that, and that's where these other technologies like multi-input, multi-output, or MIMO come into play, um, because you can deal with this directional performance. With a MIMO antenna, I can aim right at Paul in the very back corner and, and hit him at three, 400 feet, easy. Um, so this is really kind of you know, gonna come along, I think, um, a little bit slower. I think, what, as I said earlier, what you're gonna see is the backbone is gonna be this mid-band frequency deployment because it, it's, it's a great compromise of really high data rate, good performance, and it goes fairly far. Um, so massive MIMO and beamforming. What, what these really do, the best way to think about this is that um, these two kind of go together hand in hand. Um, MIMO is a whole pile of antennas all running at the same time and they might be bouncing off buildings or whatever. And all we're gonna do is correlate all those signals together and by correlating them, I can, I can aim an antenna and I can aim at multiple at the same time. So MIMO is that multiple antennas and beam forming is that signal processing that you do to correlate things and, and aim at stuff. And we all do that with our ears because you can localize sound with your ears, that's just primitive beam forming. Um, so what this does is this provides spatial diversity spatially where you want to go, and it significantly improves the speed of the networks, um, especially at high frequencies. So one thing that is kind of interesting, the way that networks are built now, you have this huge central compute core, um, and that core is typically connect, uh, uh, connected up to the phone aside from you know, Facebook messaging and stuff as you're watching video, and that video has to come from somewhere, and that's typically served by a CDN, which is the internet. What's gonna happen in 5G is that compute is gonna be pushed out and distributed of the network. And there's a bunch of interesting things that do that. One is that the latency drops significantly. And so at Mobile World Congress, for example, there was a, a talk by Van Gogh players in the room. Come on, be honest, put up your hand. You won. My wife's huge. So the Nantic people are gonna launch, they, it's this public, they're gonna launch this Harry Potter game, which is gonna be, that's gonna make them piles of money. Um, but what you need if you want to do really good AR, VR, is you need really low latency because you're basically laying objects on them and then displaying that on the phone. So if you have 100 or 200 milliseconds, paradigm falls apart. So that's one example of, of what you can do with edge compute, and I think there's only one person in the room that's going to be really happy about that, but <laughs> go. <laughs> Live that dream. Um, but for basically stick um, a CDN on the edge and play out data for low latency, and you can have that distributed. Um, you can also have receive points if you want to do contest ingest and have low latency to get to the edge and you can maybe even distribute those. So there's some things here but the key is low latency. The other thing is that by distributing out like this you can actually orchestrate. So orchestrate in, in a cloud context means I'm basically going to define a service and then push that service out across the network and it's all going to be hooked together by APIs. So you can basically orchestrate a service out over this entire network and that has a whole bunch of interesting possibilities for media. Um, we'll skip on to the next one here. So the next service, and I'm, I'm kind of showing here with my little color bars, which I haven't pointed out, where these are going to be located in the network. So a lot of this has to do with, with radio. Um, edge compute crosses radio and, and, uh, and, and backhaul, or it basically bridges radio and backhaul. Network slicing, on the other hand, covers everything. And this is, this is one of the big promises of 5G. Um, the interesting thing is, to do it, but no one's actually come out and said, so here's how we're going to do it, and here's how much it's going to cost you, because we'll come up to it at the end, kind of talking about what this point, but it's like a real one, so it's, it's used. This edge compute, what you can do is you can actually build what's called a software-defined wide area network, so I can actually kind of collect up a bunch of these characteristics, put them together, and then define you a service on that network that says, okay, here's your service, you really love low latency. So I can give you that because I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you up at the highest frequency millimeter wave. I'm gonna rely on edge compute. I'm gonna orchestrate something that's gonna be a service just, just for you or for this segment of people who need that service. Um, you can also do things like um, massive IoT. So you have a whole bunch of sensors out there. Maybe it's a farming application and we've littered sensors all over a field to collect data. Um, those actually don't really need low latency. We just need the data to get there sometime. They're not high bandwidth, so let's not provision a lot of bandwidth. So that's kind of the other extreme, which is I don't really care when it gets there as long as it gets there, and it's not high bandwidth. Um, this is one of the much more complicated parts of 5G, and I think it's going to be some time before we actually see this, see this deployed fully. Um, so 
the question is, what can you do with it? And I pulled this out because every 5G presentation I've been to, someone puts this up, so I, did, I wanted to hang with the cool kids and put up the... Um, the answer, if you look at this, is you can do everything. And that's, that's how it's been presented. I think that's been part of the challenge with 5G. It's been really, really, really hyped. Um, but you can see with the technologies that underlie it, this, this stuff is, is, is possible. It's just going to take some time. And it's like any technology, you know, it's having a conversation over 10. There's a talk on that this afternoon. We're doing that too. That's cool tech. It works great. It's really just emerging right now. And people are building real systems and using it. This is further behind than SMPTE 2110 for sure. Right? And, and you'll see kind of, you know, some of the data that I have later about, about where you can get it. So the point of this triangle is to show that with these um, with massive IoT, so we can do sensor networks, we can do low latency, ultra reliable um, contributions, so we can do a self-driving car. A self-driving car needs to be pretty low latency because it's going up to the cloud and object recognizing things and trying not to run over them. So it needs speed, it needs low latency. Or just you know extreme bandwidth, so enhanced mobile broadband. Um, people are seeing this, and the networks that deployed, some of the performance they're getting is actually pretty spectacular. It's probably because there's no one else on the network yet. There's very few 5G devices. As you load the network more, um, it all comes down to economics. Networks are expensive to build. They're going to get as many people on them as they can. So where can you actually get this? Is this like a real thing? And I'll show you a couple examples that I found as I was off trolling the internet. Um, so, according to uh, my source here, which is speedtest.net, where they have this whole site that tracks 5G deployment worldwide, there are 279 locations globally with commercial availability, which surprised me, because I, I did, that's a lot more than I thought. Um, there's a couple of notable deployments. South Korea is by far leading the world. The whole country is practically 5G already. Um, another one that's interesting, um, if you happen to be in San Marino, Anybody know where San Marino is? Put up your hand if you know where San Marino is. It's in Italy, right? It's a little country inside Italy. All 33,000 residents of San Marino enjoy 5G. It's 33,500. So it's, I think they need one tower. It's pretty small. <laughs> um, and another really interesting commercial deployment um, is in the UK, and I think they've got five or six cities up and running. Those are showing um, sites deployed. And it's a mix of, of commercial and demonstration. And, and you have to zoom in on a, on a country. So that, that, that like 227 <coughs> is actually Switzerland. And a lot of it is, is test sites, right? And we have, like, we have test sites in Canada. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, I mean, there are commercial deployments in the US. Like this is one that, that I found. And if you've been following the press, you've, you've seen this, right? Chicago and Houston um, have deployments. Um, on Verizon, and this is this is real. This is 5G NR. This isn't marketing 5G, um, and and the performance is interesting. I mean, they're they're getting um, pretty. In, or sorry, uh, AT and T's in Dallas, but Verizon is in Chicago and Houston. Um, they're getting pretty interesting speeds. If you're uh, on ultra wideband, which is millimeter wave, and you're within range of the tower, um, 1.3 gigabits. That's pretty fast. Right? That, that's kind of the promise of, of what this technology is supposed to do. On the other hand, for people in more like six, seven hundred megabits, right? And that may be because they didn't provision as much or because there's more people on the cell. The latencies, I mean, the promise, if you've read all the, all the hype, they're saying network latency of one millisecond. Um, nobody is seeing that yet. Will that come? Maybe. But I think you're going to need real network slicing to actually make that work. And that's obviously interesting for media. Digero is incredibly interested in that level of, of low latency. Great question. That's my next slide. <laughs> so here's a deployment where I could actually get costs. And I did some research on this. And if you want to buy a 5G plant on EE in the UK, it's 54 pounds for 10 gig of data a month. Now, their, their data costs are probably half of what we see in Canada, typically. Canadians tend to pay pretty high data rates, traditionally. Um, but they have this uh, deployed in six cities, Belfast, Birmingham, Cardiff, Edinburgh, London, and Manchester. And you can see Ben Wood there on Twitter, and he's, um, he's pretty excited because he got 680 megabits in like a real deployment. That's, that's an impressive speed. So, you know, pricing, I would say, what is that? That's like uh, five pounds 40 a gig-ish. So it's like 10 bucks a gig, 12 bucks a gig. It's okay. It's not, it's not too much more than what you're seeing. But again, we'll have to see, I think, in the US, Verizon was basically doing an upcharge on an LTE plan to give you 5G. If you wanted 5G, you paid, I don't know, like 10 or 20 bucks a month extra to get it. 
Um, so the low frequency spectrum auction was completed in early 2019 and everybody but Bell was all over that and Bell wasn't all over it according to the press um, because they're in a partnership with TELUS and TELUS is all over it. So should be fine there. Um, the three and a half form, the backbone globally um, and you'll be harm we'll be harmonized with the US and Mexico. This is all being organized and this is the core spectrum in Europe. We're not doing that auction until sometime in 2020. It's not, the date isn't set, but hopefully it's going to be early 2020, because if not, I think Canada is going to be lagging a wee bit. In terms of the rollout in Canada, there's trials happening now. Uh, we have 5G test hubs operating, so we happen to have one um, in Waterloo. Rogers is launching one um, in BC in partnership with, um, with UBC. And TELUS has said that, that, that they plan to basically have 5G to Canada in 2020. So they're not giving firm dates. But I would say based on what, what I'm seeing and, and so on, I would say you know, the earliest is probably the end of 2020. And when I say available, as you'll see later, you need more than just the network. You need the devices. There's a whole bunch of things that, that you need in place. I'd say end of 2020 or early 2020, 2021 is a, is a realistic um, timeline for this. Um, so you know, we come at this as DeGero. You guys know us for our you know, blended or bonded uh, broadcast product is high-speed, reliable internet connectivity. Um, and the answer, of course, from us is no. And there's some really fundamental reasons why. One is that 5G coverage won't be everywhere for a long time. There are areas that just got that, um, that it's going to be some time before everywhere is 5G. And so we'll be blending 5G and LTE for sure. The other reason, of course, is that you use Wi-Fi. You're going to use Wi-Fi 6 soon, which is, which is coming out. Um, so you want to blend with those networks, and we can blend any IP network. Um, the other thing is that no single provider is going to have fun. So part of what, what the value prop has always been for blending is, why just be on one when you can be on three? Especially if you're in a mobile situation where you're driving and you may experience network fades for whatever reason. Um, so blending 5G makes a lot of sense. Geosynchronous satellites and, and emerging low Earth orbit satellites are going to offer connectivity where cellular networks can't provide it. Geo, and as soon as Leo's out, we'll be all over blending that as well. So there's kind of this connectivity umbrella, and it's like take everything you can, blend it together, and do the best you can with it. So what about 5G for media? What can you do? What's, what's interesting? So the first thing is, what are you going to need? It's not just, I we need countries to allocate spectrum. So Canada's a little bit behind on this. In the US, hopefully in September, they'll make a resolution because I don't think anything's going to happen in North America like really on scale and get aligned on that. And I believe that'll happen. Um, so we need real operational 5G networks. Then you need devices that support 5G. So there are some phones available at Mobile World Congress. I think I saw two. And the the one, um, there's an LG phone and there's a Motorola phone, and I think, er, I think there's a third one now, there's a Samsung phone. So these are first generation um, 5G phones that have new radios, new antennas. And so for us as a provider, you know, we need modems to be available. We design the systems, you, inc you, know, you include them in. Fortunately, we've seen this coming, so all of our stuff is 5G ready, so there might be some that you need to get, or we'll do some change out of, of pieces. Um, but in general, um, we believe we're ready. Then you need a 5G, and then you need a willingness to pay. And, and, and we saw this story. This was like from two days ago, and we thought this was hilarious. The point here is that all this speed is great, and the coverage is going to be great, but you're going to have to be willing to pay for it. So um, the contribution, we've talked about reduced latency and sustained speeds needed to support 4K. Um, we believe this is a great complement to network blending. You can blend all the networks like we always do. Um, and I think if you're in kind of a, a nomadic, so go somewhere and set up, and you can get line of sight to a tower. Millimeter wave is a really great um, application for that because the millimeter wave gear is going to be a little bigger because it's typically going to be MIMO. Um, but, but you can get like a gigabit that's pretty darn reliable, and we think that's going to be a really interesting um, application for people. In terms of distribution and broadcast, um, the BBC, I, I encourage you to go take a look at what the BBC is doing. They are actually doing broadcast over 5G. So they did a trial in the, uh, in the Orkney Islands where they're actually sending radio over 5G broadcast mode, which is really cool. Um, and they're also, they, because they're the BBC and they have piles of R&D money, they made their own 5G modems ahead of everybody. And they're actually doing television broadcast because 5G has a, has a kind of 
one to many broadcast mode, and they're actually doing television broadcasts over 5G with hardware that they've built themselves. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and we think here again, first last mile with blended networks. So we've got a, a product Iron Route for Media that'll enable reliable distribution. Um, 5G is going to be really great for backing for you know um, being included as a component of that. We've seen some really interesting stuff today about workflow, about doing things in the cloud, um, you know, editing AI. Um, all of that relies on connectivity. If you want to get to the cloud, you need. To, if you've got a fiber, fine. Uh, as our founder Bogdan likes to say, you know, he's got this funny joke, what's fiber's biggest enemy, right? <laughs> so, and, and we should probably pick another vendor because we always throw John Deere under the bus, which isn't fair. Um, but, but there, um, the message there is that it's rely fiber's reliable until it's not. And if someone digs or cuts, then you're done. And we've actually had a situation in Canada where someone cut fiber and people stayed on air using Digero, using cellular networks. Um, so I think here we see that especially in mobile and nomadic, but also in high rel situations, um, having this high speed reliable connectivity to enable IP workflows to and from the cloud is absolutely critical. So we're partnering with Microsoft and hopefully some of the people that presented today because it looks super interesting. So cloud-based production. Um, and then finally, the edge compute. This is an area that we're starting to look at. We think this is incredibly interesting um, and trying to think of use cases and how we could build out solutions that would really help exploit that, that, that low latency processing. So in summary, um, 5G rollout has begun. There's limited availability. Um, you need more than just the network. Broad adoption, I would say early to mid 2021. And by broad adoption, I mean you can go down to your local store. You have about five or six phones. You can get a 5G plan and you're good to go. Um, network blending, we believe, is needed for some time. And we think there's a lot of many or, or, or many new exciting and interesting use cases possible. And I guess we look to our customer base to come and say, what about this? What about that? So we can develop cool new things. Thank you very much.